achievement. Tombs that would protect the mummified remains of the pharaohs of Egypt for all eternity. Though they have been in existence for 4,000 years, the pyramids still have secrets. And without one man, they simply wouldn't have existed. In the remote Egyptian deserts, he overcame disaster to build the very first pyramids. And exploring them has revealed his genius. Though unknown today, he was the greatest of all the Egyptian pharaohs. He was Sneferu. Egyptologist Dr. Bob Breyer has a long climb ahead of him. His quest to find out more about the man responsible for the building of something as fantastic, as breathtaking, and as large as the Great Pyramid at Giza. He's always amazed with the Great Pyramid. What impresses me most right now is the height. I'm about 40 stories up, and I still have a ways to go. Up until the time the Eiffel Tower was completed, it was the tallest building on Earth. What people don't realize is it's also a marvel of engineering precision. The base is 13 acres, but the sides are perfectly oriented on the four compass points. Before a building like this could be built, you had to solve immense engineering problems. The ancient Egyptian builders weren't perfect. There were failures, disasters, problems. And the man who solved the problems, the one who went beyond the disasters, was the pharaoh Sneferu. He's the one who showed Egypt how to build the pyramids. In Egyptian history, the pharaoh Sneferu was a legend. His name would have been as famous as Napoleon, or Alexander the Great is to us. But by a strange twist of fate, today he is almost unknown. The reason may lie with the fact that it is the pyramids built by his sons and grandsons at Giza that are visited in such droves by tourists. In fact, these pyramids are the final product of the Great Pyramid Building Age the supreme effort of dedicated craftsmen who'd inherited their skills from the previous generation. The pyramids that Sneferu built stand unvisited and largely unknown. Almost as large as the famous Giza pyramids, these were actually early prototypes. This is where the art of pyramid building began. But the pyramids tell us nothing of Sneferu the man. To see what he looked like, Bob Breyer has paid a visit to the crowded Egyptian museum in Cairo. This is my favorite place in the museum. And there's never anybody here. But it's a wonderful bit of history. This is the first cartouche in the world. The magical oval that encircles the pharaoh's name. That's Sneferu's name in there. He's the first pharaoh that we have personal anecdotes for. He was a man, and we know something about him as a person. He lived 2,000 years before Aristotle or Plato. But he's not just a myth. He's a human being. We even know something about the way he looked. This is Sneferu on his throne here. But it's not an idealized portrait. It's not a pharaoh staring off into eternity. This is what the guy really looked like. Look at his chin. It's a receding chin. 
He looks like a nerd. But he was a great man who did great things. He completed the greatest building project in the history of the world. Without Sneferu, we wouldn't have the pyramids. He was Pharaoh, but also a god on Earth. And as a god, he needed a tomb that was the most magnificent creation the human mind could imagine. He needed a pyramid. The six largest pyramids in Egypt were actually built in a period of less than a hundred years. It was an amazing feat. In a primarily rural culture, using only copper tools, the Egyptians cut, transported, and placed in exact position more than 10 million blocks of limestone, weighing an average of two tons each, to build the pyramids at Maidum, Dashur, and Giza. Imagine moving a large block of stone into place every three minutes, day and night, continuously, for a hundred years. Not only did the Egyptians achieve this, but they did so without using wheels, which would have sunk into the desert sands. Every block was pulled on sleds or rollers to its final position in the pyramid. Built without mortar, these buildings were incredible. They were perfectly aligned, their measurements accurate to mere millimeters. There are more than 70 pyramids in Egypt. The ones visited by millions of tourists each year are the successes. But in remote Egyptian deserts are the failures spectacular disasters that had to be abandoned. Sneferu was the first to succeed in building the first true pyramid. This unknown genius ruled at the beginning of Egyptian civilization. His pyramid was already 25 centuries old when Cleopatra showed it to Caesar. So Sneferu was in fact the first great Egyptian. Hollywood may be responsible for many of our preconceptions about ancient Egypt. One is that the pyramids were built by slaves, forced to haul huge loads while being whipped by the cruel overseers. In reality, they were built by free labor, which makes Sneferu's achievement even more incredible. He had to organize and pay thousands of workers for decades in order to build his pyramids. From a nation of farmers, hundreds of thousands of men were selected, divided into teams, coordinated, and dispatched to various work sites. But why did the world's first major building project occur in Egypt? Ancient Egypt had a unique advantage. Every year, melting snow from the distant mountains of Africa flowed north to the sea. The swelling Nile flooded the fields, stopping only when it reached the base of the pyramids. For the Egyptians, the Nile deluge was a mystical event. Carrying rich topsoil up from the south, the river first turned red. Then, as it swept up vegetation as it flowed along, it turned green. Finally, the Nile rose by almost 10 meters. When the flood water receded over the fields, it left in its wake a rich, fertile mud, ideal for growing crops. It was the Nile alone that turned the desert green. Without it, Egypt would be a barren desert, and Sneferu could not have built the pyramids. To channel the waters of the Nile to their fields, villagers joined together to create networks of irrigation canals. And so, in the fertile Nile Valley, the first nation was born.
The Nile made it possible for Egypt to produce endless fields of crops, flax, grains, vegetables, everything a society needed. It was here that the Egyptian capacity for cooperation was born, a vital ingredient for a vast building project. All that was missing was a great leader, and Sneferu was that man. Sneferu was an ambitious pharaoh, and he was the first to have aspirations abroad. In ancient Egypt, to take any journey outside its borders was considered a bold and dangerous venture. If an Egyptian died in a foreign land, far from the priests, embalmers and rituals, he would not be mummified. All hope for eternal life in the next world would be lost. But Sneferu dared to defy custom. He sent his army on trading expeditions, north to Lebanon for tall cedar logs, east to Sinai for turquoise and minerals, and south to Nubia for gold. Under Sneferu, Egypt became a powerful international force. Sneferu was renowned for his expeditions into the Sinai to mine turquoise. Such a venture required enormous organization. Taking 500 men and donkeys into the eastern desert would have probably required 30 boats for transport on the Red Sea and 50 tons of food a day. Once across the sea, they would have faced a difficult five-day trek by donkey to the mines at Wadi Magara. Tunneling into the mountains in search of turquoise was also dangerous, but an even greater threat were the hostile Bedouin tribes. Sneferu and his army made the Sinai safe for the miners. Bob Breyer has come to the mines to see what he can find. This boat carved on a mountain in the middle of a desert may at first seem strange. But boats were an important part of the expedition and the men wanted to record it all. This was a daring adventure and the men must have talked of it for the rest of their lives. They were crossing the Red Sea into foreign territory for the first time, and there was a very real chance that they would never return. They left their mark wherever they went. It was here on the top of a mountain in a cave that the miners slept. They built a shrine to the goddess Hathor, the mistress of turquoise. Building the shrine took workers away from the mines, but the kindly Sneferu permitted it. He even sent skilled stone carvers so the men could record their expedition's successes, creating a field of engraved tablets. Today, they are still standing just as they did in ancient times. This one simply lists the names of the men on one expedition. But on this tablet is a far more interesting tale of suffering and heroism. The pharaoh's treasurer has recorded the expedition he led. Though winter was the season for mining, he refers to the heat of the Sinai Desert. We arrived in this land the third month of the second season. So the team were traveling in high summer. He continues, in the summer the mountains branded our skin. So these miners couldn't possibly have been slaves. They were willing to risk their lives to bring back precious turquoise for their pharaoh, Sneferu.
turquoise that the miners brought back from Sinai was fashioned into butterfly inlays for finely crafted bracelets, gifts from Sneferu to his wife, Queen Hetaferes. Sneferu wasn't just a pyramid builder and explorer, he was a patron of the arts. His royal workshops produced extraordinary masterpieces in sculpture, painting, jewelry and furniture. The artistic achievements that took place during Sneferu's reign were so outstanding that they set the standard for the next two and a half thousand years. The Maidum geese look as natural today as when they were first painted, four thousand years ago. Statues of Sneferu's sons are the first great portraits in stone and have never been surpassed. The fine limestone bust of Ankav shows him as a mature and thoughtful man, his extra weight indicating a successful man. Ankav's brother Hemienu has rolls of fat, so he must have been extremely prosperous. In the Cairo Museum is another of Sneferu's sons, Rahotep, and his beautiful wife, Nofret. They sit side by side, their rock crystal eyes staring out at the thousands of visitors who stop to look at them. Nofret's statue shows great detail. Egyptian women often wore wigs, and on her forehead you can see her own hair peeking out from under her wig. The furniture that Sneferu had built for his wife is among the most beautiful ever made in ancient Egypt. They are masterpieces of simplicity. The clean lines are straight and elegant. There are no gaudy displays of gilding here, merely simple gold hieroglyphs to proclaim the queen's titles. Queen's treasures, among them her beautiful canopied bed, were placed in her tomb for her enjoyment in the next world. The ancient Egyptians were resurrectionists. They believed that the body would rise after death and carry on in the next world. And this is the reason for the practice of mummification a complex religious ritual that took 70 days to preserve a body. It was crucial to protect the mummy from tomb robbers, because if a robber entered the tomb and destroyed it, then the deceased couldn't exist in the next world. Without an intact body, all hope of immortality was lost. It was the worst catastrophe that could befall an ancient Egyptian. Once the mummy was preserved, an elaborate tomb was built to protect it for all eternity. These early tombs were called mastabas. They were carved into the bedrock beneath the sand and covered over with a large superstructure made from bricks. The ancient Egyptians called them the Houses of Eternity. This mastaba was one of the largest ever built. It has a remarkable feature to prevent it from being robbed. And Bob Breyer has come here to study it. There is absolutely no access to the burial chamber from above ground. I'm going down into the mastaba the only way possible. Through the robber's entrance, they tunnel through the mud brick, through the bedrock, and into the entrance to the burial chamber, right here. This is the burial of a very important person, probably a queen or a prince. This sarcophagus is the first one in history. The body was placed inside, the lid was slid shut, but still it was robbed. 
Here's the robber's mallet that they used to prop open the lid. After the burial, this chamber was roofed over. And in spite of the 100,000 tons of mud brick and stone that were placed on top, it was robbed. Sneferu had a big problem. His dilemma was that it was almost impossible to stop tomb robbers. Even in Sneferu's time, his own wife's tomb was robbed. No matter how complicated the passages inside the tomb, the robbers still found the treasure. Why? Because the tomb robbers were very often the men who built the tomb. The solution to tomb robbing was to create something so massive that even if the robbers knew where the burial chamber was, they couldn't get in. But Sneferu wasn't the first to try this. The process began at Saqqara. The step pyramid of Saqqara was completed during Sneferu's childhood, and it would have had a profound effect on him. For the step pyramid was the first major stone construction ever to be built. civilization, building has evolved. Successively larger and more ambitious constructions were built across a period of time until it was possible to build a colossal structure. But this was not the way it happened in ancient Egypt. Quite suddenly, without any predecessor, the step pyramid was built. There are many indications that the Egyptians were just learning to work stone. The masons were merely copying the columns and walls of existing palaces that were built out of bundles of papyrus reeds and mud brick. Because they were faithfully copied in stone, the architectural details were rendered completely useless. There are doors that can't swing open or shut, reed mats that roll up over doorways that can't be lowered. This is where building in stone began. 2,000 years after the step pyramid was built, the Greeks were proud to say that they learned how to build in stone from the Egyptians. The step pyramid was designed for Pharaoh Zosa. His architect wanted to create a grand burial place for his king. So he designed a large mastaba and placed successively smaller ones on top of it, creating the wedding cake effect. Because this was the first large stone building in the world, the builders faced many new challenges. They weren't yet skilled enough in working the stone, so the blocks that made up the pyramid were only roughly cut and fitted unevenly one on top of another, threatening the pyramid's collapse. The architect solved the problem by slanting the walls inward, so the pyramid was literally leaning against itself preventing the unstable mass from collapsing. When the step pyramid was completed, it was the most fantastic construction the world had ever seen. It probably stood 10 times taller than any other building. Taking thousands of workers nearly two decades to complete, it must have been the talk and the pride of all Egypt. The step pyramid must have had a profound effect on the young Sneferu. He may even have dreamed of building his own one day. When he became Pharaoh, his chance came at my doom. Even at first glance, it's obvious there is something very wrong here, but it's not exactly clear what. The monument resembles a tower more than a pyramid. There are many unanswered questions here. Why are the walls of the burial chamber rough and unfinished? And where is the pharaoh's sarcophagus? In the burial chamber, the 4,000-year-old cedar beams still lie in place, ready to lift the sarcophagus. But there is no trace of it, nor any evidence that the burial chamber was ever used. Nevertheless, it represents a major architectural breakthrough. This is the first above-ground burial chamber in Egypt. Creating a room inside a pyramid rather than under it caused one tremendous problem. 
With the entire weight of the pyramid above, how could the ceiling be prevented from collapsing? Sneferu solved the problem by placing the stone blocks of the walls closer and closer to the center of the room as it rose higher. As the walls were built up, the very top block forming the ceiling only spanned a distance of a few centimeters. There was the answer. The first corval ceiling in history had been created. The Maidum pyramid is odd in appearance because of its construction. It was originally intended to be a step pyramid, but as it neared completion, it was expanded several times. Probably because it was believed that a pyramid should not be finished before the pharaoh's death. When the pyramid was completed with eight steps, Sneferu was still in good health, so the construction was continued. The steps of the pyramid were filled in with fine white limestone. This was the first attempt at a true pyramid. But the Maidum pyramid has a fatal architectural flaw. The final outer casing stones were not sufficiently anchored into the body of the pyramid. Because they rested on the smooth surface of the step pyramid inside, the stones began slipping, causing the first technological disaster in history. And that's the reason for its strange appearance. Later generations found it easy to quarry the loose stones, leaving only the steep inner core. What we see today is the result of 5,000 years of vandalism. Sneferu had to abandon his pyramid. The large stone tablets in the small chapel at its base were never inscribed. The burial chamber walls were left rough and unfinished, and the ancient cedar beams were never used to lift the pharaoh's sarcophagus into its final resting place. In fact, the only way we know the pyramid belonged to the pharaoh Sneferu is because of graffiti written almost a thousand years after it was built. The scribe, Ankhepakari Senet, visited the pyramid and wrote on the chapel wall, I came to see the beautiful temple of King Sneferu. I found it as though heaven were within it and the sun shining in it. May heaven rain fresh myrrh. May it drip with incense on the roof of the temple of King Sneferu. Imagine the architect Sneferu's own son appearing before the pharaoh to tell him that the work of the last 20 years was in ruins and that his tomb was unusable. It says much for Sneferu's personality. Instead of raging and giving up, he simply ordered that the site of my doom be abandoned and a new location be found. Still in need of a burial place, Sneferu moved swiftly, building a monument even more ambitious than the Maidum disaster. A pyramid more than twice the volume of the one he abandoned. A monument that would far outshine anything the world had ever seen. Now the architects had the benefit of their experience. The Dashur pyramid was designed from the beginning as a true pyramid. Learning from the earlier failure, the masons used much larger casing stones. This made it possible to properly tie them into the masonry of the pyramid. They also inclined the blocks inward toward the center of the pyramid. This technique was so successful that this pyramid is the only one that still has most of its casing stones in place today. There's an interesting bit of graffiti here. Hundreds of years after Sneferu was dead, a priest by the name of Wynon came here and wrote his name. He still wanted to be associated with Sneferu. The hieroglyphs are interesting for priests. There's a little bowl here that's pouring out water. That means to purify. And if you put a man behind it, it's a man who purifies, a priest. That's Wenonk. Mohammed, Fala. 
From the entrance, there is a 70 meter drop to the body of the pyramid. One of the longest and most difficult descending passages of all the pyramids. The finely polished blocks of the wall are smooth and surprisingly cold to the touch. The passage still has the railway tracks used by the excavators in the 1950s to remove the rubble from Sneferu's burial chamber. The passage was designed to lower the sarcophagus into the heart of the pyramid. Once the corridor descends beneath the bedrock, the smooth blocks cease and the walls become very rough. There is still another 45 meters to go underground beneath the bedrock. Entering a room with a 12 meter corbelled ceiling comes as a shock and a relief after crouching for so long in the narrow passage. Still, Bob Breyer has not yet reached the burial chamber. This is merely a vestibule. Entry to the burial chamber is achieved via a swaying rope ladder. At the top, a hole in the wall leads to Sneferu's final resting place. A long ladder is the only way forward from here. reaches the top of the ladder, he's delighted to notice that all four walls are stepped inward. This pyramid has a corbelled ceiling. through the narrow tunnel made by ancient tomb robbers, Bob finally reaches the corridor through which Sneferu's mummy would have passed on its way to the burial chamber 4,000 years ago. Amazingly, there is a constant breeze of fresh air blowing through here, and some investigators believe there are hidden passages yet to be discovered. burial chamber. The great thing about Sneferu was he didn't give up after the Maidum disaster. He built this. When it was completed, it was the greatest room on the planet. It goes up 55 feet. Mohammed, I'm not going to like Shukran. 55 feet up, corbelled ceiling, the walls go in all the way up to the top. But there was a problem. The walls started to move under the tremendous weight of the pyramid above it. Down here are cedar beams, 4,000 years old. They had to be brought in when the walls started to move. There were problems here too. The walls started to crack, move inward, and to make sure that the entire thing didn't collapse, they brought in the beams to hold it up. Originally, the Dasho pyramid was intended to be a true pyramid. But when the problem of the burial chamber developed, Sneferu's architects decided to finish it by reducing the angle from 54 degrees to 43 degrees. That is why it is known as the Bent Pyramid. By decreasing the angle, the ancient builders also reduced the amount of stone needed to complete the pyramid and lessened the weight on the chambers inside. But despite this, the pyramid was still too unstable to allow the burial of Sneferu's mummy to take place here. Sneferu had built the two largest buildings in the history of the world, 
and both of them were unusable. But still, he would not give up. Time was running out for the aging pharaoh. He had to build a successful burial place before he died. For the Egyptians, the bent pyramid was a proud achievement. Instead of abandoning the site as he had done at Maidum, Sneferu built his last pyramid less than a kilometer away. Today, in the glare of the sun, it appears red. At first sight, the red pyramid seems to be a success. The burial chamber is stable. Its design makes it the first true pyramid in history. are some signs that Sneferu had to make compromises in order to complete the pyramid in time for his burial. It's smaller than the bent pyramid and its sides slope at a conservative 43 degrees. In the red pyramid, Sneferu finally solved his engineering problems and it was here that his mummy was laid to rest. Centuries after his death, pious priests of the cult of Sneferu were still placing offerings here for the soul of the pharaoh, so that he might have life, prosperity, and stability for all time. When the bent pyramids, Sneferu and his workers learned the art of pyramid building. At my doom, they learn the necessity of fixing the outer casing blocks securely into the mass of the pyramid. A lesson they carried out so successfully at the bent pyramid that the outer casing stones still remain in good condition today. At the bent pyramid, they discovered how to create large internal spaces with the use of corbel ceilings. And they learned from the subsequent problems this can cause. It's from Sneferu's pyramids that the ancient Egyptians developed the skills that enable them to cut, move, and fit large blocks of stone to build the pyramids of Maidum, Dashur, and eventually the greatest pyramids of all at Giza. Sneferu's tightly knit family worked together and achieved remarkable results. Sneferu had at least five sons. Some he made viziers of Egypt, keeping the power close to him and establishing a family trust that was to extend throughout his life. In addition to holding the post of vizier, several of Sneferu's sons became architects. One of the most famous is Ankaf, the architect of the second largest pyramid on the Giza plateau. Ankaf's brother, Hemienu, became vizier to another brother, the pharaoh Cheops. Hemienu was probably the architect of the Great Pyramid. Ranefer was one of the sons who didn't enter the family business of pyramid building. He became a high priest and general of the army. They were indeed one of the most successful families in history. Growing up with a father so obsessed with the building of pyramids must have had a profound effect on the brothers. They would have accompanied Sneferu, first to view the progress of the Maidum Pyramid, then the Bent Pyramid, and finally the Red Pyramid. The passions of the father were truly passed to the sons. Sneferu's most famous son was Cheops, his successor. He is remembered today as the pharaoh who built the Great Pyramid, which became one of the seven wonders of the world. The Great Pyramid is undoubtedly Sneferu's legacy to his son. Without Sneferu's experience, it could not have been built. Throughout Sneferu's three pyramids, there is one underlying feature, the corbel ceiling. His ingenious solution to distributing the weight of the stone blocks above the burial chamber made the construction of all the pyramids possible. From the cautious start at my doom, to the spectacular ceilings in the pyramids of Dashur, to the pinnacle of expression here in the grand gallery of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. One of the greatest interior spaces of all time 
the corbelled roof runs for 46 meters. It gives the illusion that the gallery is even higher than its actual nine meters. In the burial chamber, Cheops surpassed even his father's achievements. But he hid from view his unique solution to the problem of protecting the roof from the incredible weight above it. The granite slabs that form the ceiling could not possibly support the pyramid above without some means of distributing the weight. To see Cheops' solution, Bob Bryer must climb through a hole in the very top of the Grand Gallery. This is the secret to why the roof of the burial chamber didn't collapse. I'm directly above the burial chamber in a low room that was designed to take the pressure off the roof of the burial chamber beneath me. Above me are four other chambers, pretty much like this one. And on top of them, there are two huge slabs that form an inverted V, taking even more pressure off the burial chamber. It's a kind of corbelled roof that's been streamlined. Sneffer would have loved it. The relieving chambers worked beautifully. 5,000 years after they were built, the burial chamber is still intact, virtually undamaged. If tomb robbers hadn't found it, Cheops' mummy would still be here today. Not only did Sneferu pave the way for his son Cheops to build the greatest pyramid in the world, his pursuit of foreign trade ultimately provided his son with one of the most important possessions he would take with him to the next world. In ancient Egypt, the only transportation was by boat or by donkey. Donkeys covered short hauls and boats were used for any great distance. In 1954, a boat was discovered buried next to the Great Pyramid. It was almost 45 meters long, and it was built by Cheops from timbers brought back from Lebanon by his father, Sneferu. Although the boat was found in pieces, the cedar planks were still strong enough for the boat to be reassembled. Some of the timbers are so large that they could never be replicated today. There simply aren't any cedar trees left that would be big enough. Typically, in ancient Egyptian boat design, the planks were tied together. When placed in the water, the wood would swell and the ropes would shrink, sealing the holes and making the boat watertight. With no mast and no sails, it was propelled by oars. But what was the purpose of this boat? Was it used by the pharaoh in his lifetime? Or was it intended for the pharaoh's last journey into the next world? To solve the mystery, a two-meter model has been constructed in the United States, following the exact measurements of Cheops's boat. At the Webb Institute for Naval Architecture in Long Island, testing began. The model glided through the water with ease, leaving practically no wake. Because there was no indication of a mast or sails on the original boat, it would seem that the oars provided the only propulsion. But computerized tests show that the boat's oars couldn't possibly have generated enough power to propel it. In fact, the oars seem to have functioned more like a keel on a modern yacht, giving the boat stability and direction. So how did the boat move through the water? This is uh, no heel, no yaw. Run 40. Okay, here we go. Okay. It's known that ritual boats were often towed in ancient Egypt as they transported the body of the deceased from the east to the west bank for burial. 
The 4,000-year-old cedar boat may well have brought the body of Sneferu's son to its final resting place in the Great Pyramid. died, his body would have crossed the Nile, landing close to where the Sphinx stands today. His body would have been taken a short distance to the Bali Temple, where it would have been carefully mummified. Exactly 70 days after his death, the mummified pharaoh would have been taken up a causeway leading to his pyramid. Accompanied by priests chanting the ancient rituals, the body would have been laid to rest in the heart of the most extraordinary monument humankind has ever created. The great era of pyramid building only lasted as long as Sneferu's family were in power. His son built the Great Pyramid, and immediately next to it, his grandson built the second largest pyramid. After this, the drive and energy needed to build these monuments faded. Later pyramids were merely poor reproductions. The ancient Egyptians looked back at the time of Sneferu and considered it to be their golden age. 700 years after Sneferu's death, the pharaohs of the 12th dynasty returned to Dashur to build their pyramid in the shadow of Sneferu's monuments. This is the mud brick pyramid of Amenemet III, now eroded and crumbling. like these would never be built again. Later Egyptians, when boasting of greatness, would say, not since the time of Sneferu has its like been seen. Cleopatra, was she a sly seductress or plain hard-working mother? Great Egyptians, tomorrow at 10. Next on Discovery Channel, 101 servicemen want to join the Australian SAS. They don't know what they've let themselves in for.